Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about matrices and its determinants. Indeed, in today's part 46, we will discuss the Leibniz formula for determinants. However, before we start with that, I really want to thank all the nice people who support me on Steady, here on YouTube, via PayPal or by other means. Only because of your support, it's possible to keep this channel up. And as you know, you can always download a PDF version and a quiz for this video with the link in the description. Okay, now for the start of this video, let's recall the n-dimensional volume form we have discussed in the last video. It's a map that gets n vectors from Rn as an input and a real number as an output. Moreover, we have defined some properties it should fulfill. For example, we have said it should be linear in each entry. In addition, it should also be entry symmetric, which means if you exchange two entries, we change the sign of the outcome. And finally, we normalize the function by saying that the n-dimensional volume of the unit cube should be 1. And now in today's video, we will show there is one and only one function that fulfills these rules. Moreover, we will see that the volume form can be written with the Leibniz formula. And in order to show this, we just have to calculate the output of the volume form. And as for the input, it already makes sense to choose a good name for the vectors we put in. Namely, we name them as we would name the entries of a matrix. In other words, the second index here tells us in which entry we are. And now for the start, I want to use the linearity in the first entry Hence, let's ignore the other entries for the moment. This means we will simply shorten these vectors with star. So you see, this makes the whole formula here much more compact. Okay, and now let's rewrite the first vector here as a linear combination. Namely, we do that by using the canonical unit vectors. So you see, without changing much, we now have a linear combination. Therefore, now we are able to use the linearity in the first entry. This means we can pull out the addition sign and the scalar multiplication. And of course, we do that for the whole linear combination and this is the result. And here please note, still the first index for A has to correspond to the index in E. Okay, and now I can tell you, writing these dots here all the time is a little bit cumbersome so we better use a sum notation. So what we need is a sum that goes from 1 to n. So let's choose an index j that goes from 1 to n. And then this is all where we compact. We have aj1 and ej. However, at this point I can already tell you we will have a lot of sums in the end, so it's better to use an index with a number already. So let's call it j1 because then this one corresponds to the one in our second index of a. Indeed, at this point, some people introduce a comma here to distinguish both indices. Therefore, from now on, we will also do that now. Okay, and now in the next step, we can resubstitute our star here. After doing that, we see we can do exactly the same thing again, but now for the second entry here. Hence, if we do that, we get a second sum here. And then, of course, a good name for the index would be j2. Moreover, we get aj22 as the factor in front, and in the volume form, we find ej2 in the second entry. And of course, in the same way as before, we don't change the other entries in the volume form. So for example, the third vector here is still the same. However, of course, now in the next step, we can continue with this one. And then we continue, continue until we reach the last vector here. In other words, in the end, we will have exactly n sums in front. And the last index will simply be jn. And then we also know what we have as the factors because we simply go through all of them. And we still see that the index for j corresponds with the second index of a. And lastly, inside the volume form, we just find the canonical unit vectors. The only thing we see here, for each entry, we have a different index. 
And there we have it. This is our formula. If we assume linearity, the volume form necessarily has to look like this. However, you know, we also have the two other rules, so we can simplify this even more. For example, our anti-symmetric rule tells us that the volume form is zero in the case that two entries coincide. Therefore, we can say, if two indices here have the same value, we get out zero. This is very nice, because it means we can just ignore all the cases where at least two indices coincide in our sum. In other words, our sum here just gets smaller. So for example, we could just use one big sum symbol and say what we do. We could choose a tuple where we have our indices as entries. There, the entries should go from 1 to n again, but all entries should be different. Indeed, this is a very common mathematical concept. It's called a permutation. More precisely, it's a permutation of the set with n elements. So you could say it's a reordering of the numbers 1 to n. Indeed, you should know there are a lot of different permutations of this set, and now we want all of them. Therefore, what we say is that our tuple here goes through all permutations. And usually, capital SN denotes the set of all permutations. In fact, it's the so-called symmetric group. Okay, so now you see, our whole formula is even more compact now. However, we can make it even better if we use our last property of the volume form. Namely, now we know this volume with the canonical unit vectors is either 1 or minus 1. Other results are not possible anymore because all indices are different now. Moreover, we already know we get out 1 if we have the standard order of the canonical basis. And together with the anti-symmetric rule, we also know we get out minus 1 if we exchange two of the vectors. In other words, we just know everything if we just count the number of exchanges we need. More precisely, we get plus one if we need an even number of exchanges to get to the ordinary order. So each exchange would get us a minus sign, but if we had an even number of exchanges, it would not matter. However, with an odd number of exchanges, one minus sign would remain, and therefore the result would be minus 1. Okay, so we know everything, and I can tell you this plus or minus 1 is called the sign of the permutation. Indeed, this number here is well defined and very useful for this formula. Because now our whole formula is finished and very short. So we have the sum over all permutations, the sign of the permutation, and then just the product of the coefficients. And actually, this nice compact formula for the volume form is called the Leibniz formula. And now please recall, we want to define the determinant by using this volume form. In other words, you can read this Leibniz formula as the definition for the determinant of a square matrix. And now indeed, it tells us exactly what the determinant of a matrix is. You see? You essentially just multiply the entries of a matrix, but you have n factors. And each row and column only occurs once. And then what happens is that we simply sum up all the possibilities that we have for such a product. And we also add a plus or minus sign depending if our permutation is even or odd. So this is what you can remember. This is what the Leibniz formula tells us the combination of all possible products with n factors. So it seems like a funny calculation rule, but you already know, it gives us the volume, the orientated volume, of the parallel epiped. But you could say, if n is really large, this is not easy to calculate. And therefore, we will talk about another important formula we can get from this one in the next video. So I really hope you will be back and have a nice day. Bye.